hi and welcome. Uh, for meeting for the first time, my name is Clay and uh, welcome to the channel. So we're going to talk about how to play the prelude to Bach Cello Suite Number 1 in G major. We're going to talk about several things here in the course of the video. So if you're coming back and this is uh, you're returning here, be sure and use the, the table of contents down in the notes to get to the section that you need. And also uh, stick around to the end of this video and I'm going to give you a really great big uh, extra resource to use while you're learning this movement of the piece. So the first thing to talk about, the, the thing I notice when I'm teaching this piece to students is the string crossings, the, the unevenness. Okay, so you know what I notice with students a lot is... <laughs> I'm exaggerating ears, you know, well, sometimes it's like that, but you want, you really want these string crossings to be even. Yes. So of course, the first thing you need to do is put on the metronome. Okay. Now I've got it here on 60 with the eighth notes going. I love my Seiko metronome. I'll put links to all the stuff that I mentioned here in the in, in the notes below, but I love putting on the, the subdivisions, the eighth notes, because now at some point I would want to turn those off, but as far as getting my bow really rhythmical, hitting the strings, okay, at the right time, the subdivisions really help. If your metronome doesn't do subdivisions, then just put it on 120, just do twice as many, yes? Now, it's really important that you understand that the metronome is your first line of defense when it comes to getting these string crossings correct, making them really rhythmical and accurate. There are a few other things that you need to think about and focus on in order to get the string crossings correct. One of them is making sure that your whole arm okay, and connected to your bow hold here, okay, is correct. You know, I see you just can't play this piece accurately, all the string crossings, with your elbow dipped down like this, okay? Everything has got to move, and you really have to support this hand. This hand has to be able to flex, okay, along with the wrist like this. I can't have this kind of motion over here if my elbow's down here, because you see what happens to my bow hold immediately. It goes over here like this, yes? Okay, so. And I can always cheat down a little bit. I can flex my fingers and go down. I can't cheat and go up like this, as you can see. All right, it ruins my bow hold. So, whole arm there, okay? Metronome, whole arm. Making sure my bow hold, okay, is really great. All of these things are important, okay, to getting the string crossings correct. And I'll mention a few other things here with the string crossings before we move on to uh, talking about the bowing itself and the, the tone production. Of course, having your bow be perpendicular or parallel to the bridge, as we say. Okay, remember on the cello, sometimes it's difficult to move or to have a straight bow, as we like to say, because we're on this angle here, okay? And I've even used this sometimes in lessons where I take a hula hoop, put around a student, and you can see, you know, with the hula hoop that your hand moves in this orbit. It's up and out, okay, and then back and in. And also remember that you have to flex your wrist, okay, in order to keep the bow straight, okay? So this is another thing that can affect being able to get the string crossings correct. Another exercise. When you're doing string crossings like this, there's a moment where you're playing on two strings at once. So if you go very slowly, where you're hearing both strings at once at that moment, you're gonna exaggerate that moment where you're on two strings at once, okay? And of course, you know, you don't wanna do that in a final performance, but what you're trying to teach your hand is this exact place where it crosses the string. Because especially on the A, we can dip way too far, okay? And then we have farther to come back, makes it a little uneven. The, the D string is, Easier, I hate to say easier, but what I mean is that it's in between the, you know, the A and the G, and so if we go too far, we end up on the A, so we kind of have something that bounces us back, 
but not with the A, okay? So, especially when you're practicing the string crossing D to A, this little exercise of exaggerating the bleed, okay, between the two strings will help teach your hand the position of the bow between the two strings, okay? And furthermore, with this idea of connecting the sound, just listening for... The connection of the note. Are you finishing the note and then starting the next one at the right time? Remember, the metronome can only tell you if you started the note at the right time. It can't tell you if you actually held out the note correctly, okay? It can't tell you if you held it for the full length and made it connect to the next note, all right? You have to do that with your ears. All right, specifically to the bowing itself. There are so many variations on this, and I would never say that mine is correct or there's some other bowing that doesn't work. Maybe there are some bowings that work better than others. You know, there's a reason that there are no bowings marked in the Anna Magdalena manuscript that we go off of, okay? Or there's a reason, you know, the ones, the, the few that are there, there's a reason some people ignore them because uh, we don't have, you know, an original Bach autograph of the Bach suites, right? So the bowings in this thing run the gamut. You'll find some that really go into a ton of detail as far as trying to slur things together harmonically. It's probably the best way. You know, I tend to go with kind of a, a simple bowing here where... <laughs> Especially if it's a student that's never played anything like this before. We may be using this piece as kind of an exercise where they're just learning to play better in tune in first position. And you don't want to play some crazy bowing when you're doing this. But I've seen, you know... Or, or whatever, or I think even the Anner Bilsma uh, recording, you can tell he's doing them all separately. Very sort of Baroque uh, style, maybe. I don't know. What I would say to you is find an edition you like, talk to your teacher, and do commit to a Boeing, okay? Learn a different one later, but I would encourage you to have a Boeing that you're going to do consistently. But don't get too caught up on what is correct. You know, I think we've kind of lost the art of an improvisation that a, you know, the person who was performing this for Bach or whenever he wrote it, you know, down and, you know, the musicians are playing it for him at the court. I, you know, I think we believe he wrote this one when he had his job in Weimar. You know, there was, everybody improvised. Everybody knew how to improvise. And it, you know, made the performance, you know, wonderfully fresh and new all the time. So, I don't know, it's, a, it's kind of a slippery slope to say, ah, just do whatever you want to with the bowing. That's, that's not really the right answer either. I think also you have to be a little bit flexible. Sorry, I sort of went on there about the bowing, but... I, I, you can already tell just from, this, from me saying all of this that there's a lot of variations on the bowing, okay? I would go with a simple one here if you're just starting out, if you're just learning it. So in the beginning, you know, slurring two beats and two beats. So what I mean by that is... You know, I like that simple bowing because you're doing all of these notes down and then you're doing all of the same notes up. You know, when something repeats in music, we should strive to do it a little bit different, okay? We should try to give it a different color or a different feel, and going all down bow for the first one, and then going all up bow for the second one seems like a great way to uh, perform, you know, this idea of changing things up. If you make them the same, if you just go... What's the point, okay? I don't know, I, w I would rather do it differently and so actually keeping the bowing separate, I mean, keeping the bowing the same, more simple, allows them to be a little bit different each time, especially when you have these measures where you're repeating the same notes on beat three and four that you are on beat one and two, okay? Um, ultimately, it's your artistic choice, okay? As a friend of mine likes to say, um, there are not no right or wrong answers, just better choices. Okay, next with the bowing and the tone, to vibrato or not? To vibrato. Here's what I'll tell you. Remember that it's an ornament. Remember that it's there that you're adding it to the sound. You are coloring the sound. So I will not ever say that Baroque music should be devoid of vibrato. That's not the case. Maybe it shouldn't be so big. Maybe it shouldn't be so wide. 
Maybe we should do a little bit better job of remembering that it is an ornament and not just using it all the time. But should you use it? Of course you should use it. Just don't overuse it, okay? Again, a lot of artistic license there with the vibrato. So like when you get to the end, you know, all this business, and then you get to the last chord. That's kind of a neat sound to do no vibrato. All right, but how about we add a little vibrato? That's okay too. Okay. I wouldn't, you know, especially since it's a double stop, I wouldn't be going crazy super wide here with the vibrato. So like the Boeing reference, some recordings. Okay. Watch the performances, you know, see what the, see what the performer is doing with the vibrato. And since I mentioned recordings, this is a great segue to talk about dynamics. Okay. What should you do with the dynamics? Again, there are none in the Anna Magdalena manuscript right? So we have to decide on our own. Does that mean there were no dynamics in the Baroque? Absolutely not. That is not what that means. It means that the artist was expected to make up the dynamics. You know, it's just a totally different feel. I, I joke with my students all the time. You know, if I'm a Baroque composer, why would I waste my ink, which is probably really hard to come by. Why would I waste my ink writing down dynamics when you should know how to make them up? Why would I waste my ink with you know, crescendos and decrescendos. Don't you know how to do that? Don't you know how to make those up on your own? You know, it was not like, oh, let me give you permission to improvise or make some of this stuff up. It was expected that you would know how this stuff goes and be able to make some of these things up on your own. So reference recordings, reference different editions. There's so many editions of the Bach. In general, like in any music, when something is rising, okay, when you're getting to the end of a phrase, you know, you want to make the music go somewhere. You want to maybe do a little crescendo. You maybe want to do a little diminuendo at the end of the phrase. If it feels like harmonically that it's going somewhere a little different for a couple of measures, you change it up. Or maybe, you know, you do some different dynamics on the echo. Like in the opening. <laughs> I've heard it done that way before. In this edition here that I'm looking at, it gets down to the end of the first page and it does a long crescendo, pianissimo, all the way to, uh, you know, the, uh, let's see, it's going pianissimo actually just to piano and actually does a little diminuendo on this D here. All right, only getting up to piano. What I'm talking about when I say the D, I'm talking about the... But I've heard people, you know, crescendo to that and play that thing forte because you're climbing up. It's this big moment in the piece, you know, and so they play it big. Although the one I'm looking at right now here from IMSLP is piano. And there's a diminuendo marked on that fermata. So there you go. For sure, you want to do a crescendo and be fortissimo at the end. I'm pretty sure everybody does a crescendo and plays fortissimo at the end, or at least forte. Nobody's playing quiet at the end, okay? That's one of those, uh, if you decided all of a sudden to be completely different and play it piano at the end, you could do that, but that would be a bad choice, okay? All right, you definitely wanna be softer and do maybe a little crescendo during all this drone business. A little phrasing there. Most everybody, again, does that, all right? Uh, when you're getting in there to the... Into this stuff there at the end. Last, certainly not least, you know, all this stuff overlaps. And so when I was deciding on what order I would go in here for this tutorial, it's, it's really difficult because, you know, actually intonation should probably be one of the first things, but then the string crossing, I think, is one of the first things also that you should cover. And then that's all about the bow. So let's talk about tone and dynamics. And so I didn't mean to leave intonation for the very last and say that that's the least important. These are all equally important, which is why we have the timestamps uh, down below in the notes. Okay, first thing you should be doing with the intonation is double stops. <laughs> Play a game with yourself. How many double stops can you make between successive notes? Okay. Or when you're playing in a certain position, how many double stops? Like if you're, you know, over here 
one place that really, really gets us down here where, you know, you have the, the F sharp, C natural, and the D, the. How about I play my C with my open C? How about I play the F sharp? Hear that tritone. And the minor six. Use my fourth finger. And how about. The double stops are really helpful, especially if you have an open string like in the beginning. Because you are playing chords, which brings me to my next point, which is harmonic analysis. This can really help you understand the piece. And I think it's probably one of the most overlooked things when students are learning this piece. So what's the first chord in, in the piece? It's a G, the one, because we're in G major, yes? So it's a one chord, followed by a C chord, which is the four chord. Then followed by a D7, okay, it has a G in the bass, but we still call that a D7 because we have this F sharp and C. Because it resolves there, yes, it sounds like a dominant chord. So, one, four, five, seven, one. This is a very basic chord progression. This is like one of the foundations of all of Western music right here in the opening of this piece. And if you don't understand that, it's really, really hard to play this thing in tune. So double stops, harmonic analysis, and of course, drone pitch. Okay. Use a drone pitch to practice. All right. So the extra resource that I mentioned at the beginning of the video, there's a lot of things, a lot of topics that I talked about or mentioned during this video that I have a whole separate video for on this channel, like bow hold and straight bow and practicing with a drone, et cetera, et cetera. Even this double stop method of practicing with the Bach where I use the Bach as an example. So if there's something that I mentioned that maybe I didn't go into depth on, you have a question about, you can check it out in this playlist right here.